Please welcome Pamela Paul and Zadie Smith. Hi there. Hey. So I, I went into the office of my boss at the New York Times, where I have my day job, um, last week and told him that one of the things I was going to be doing this week was interviewing Zadie Smith, and um, he's the Dean Baquet, the executive editor of the Times, and he said, were you there the night that she sang? And so this is like basically the, the dividing point between like the cool kids at the time and like the less cool ones <laughs> yeah, sure. is that there was a, a T magazine party a number of years ago and Lady Gaga was there mm. and nobody talks about Lady Gaga being there. They all talk about Zadie singing. At I this often, tea when my party. kids are being mean to me, I often say, you realize I opened for Lady Gaga. I mean, there was a 20 minute gap, <laughs> but can we remember that? So, <laughs> so I like. Do you ever think like, why didn't I? Yes, all become the time. A singer? Yes, I think about it all the time. <laughs> um, I, I, I mean, my brothers are both performers, and I mean, the answer is because I wasn't good at performing. You know, I, so so I just couldn't. I, I once did a, s a series of auditions for a TV talent show, and I got very far up in the backstage bit, um, and then you know you have to do it in front of the producers, and I t I turn around, and I sang to the wall. And the, after I finished, the guy said, well, that's very nice, but we don't have any call for singers who sing to walls. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just, I think I, when I'm making something, I don't want to be present at the moment of its reception. So writing is perfect for that. Well, you got, you got a very good review um, as a <laughs> singer. Uh, they said she was like a torch singer. She was amazing. Um, do you, like, do you think at all of there ways in which music, you feel like, enters into your writing process? In terms to of me, rhythm it's the same thing. Writing is is rhythm, more or less, and um, not not only writing uh, my kind, but you know, a critic like James Wood is a fantastic drummer, for example. <laughs> That's about having a good ear, and a lot of people I know in writing, David tend Remnick, to have some yeah, secondary Remnick's another case, um, some secondary musical ability, or sometimes it's tennis, right? Tennis is another one imp important in the rhythm stakes. Um, so for me, it's it's the same thing. It just comes under the umbrella having having a good ear. All right. So your most recent book, Grand Union, which I hope everyone here reads, is a collection of 19 short stories. Mm. And from my perspective as the editor of the book review, like short story collections are a huge pain because to get to assign right. someone to review because right. the, the very bad review of a short story collection is like this story and then this story and right. then this story and it's incredibly boring to read. So we're going to try not to talk about this story and that story, especially for those who may not have read all of them. Do you find it hard to talk, to go around and talk about a story collection as opposed to a novel where there's one central idea? Um, yes, I mean, the, the, diff the stories are also different from each other and, and their connection for me is kind of, you know, uh, a, connect a philosophical connection between them. So it, it is hard to discuss because on the one hand, it's incredibly boring for <laughs> audience and, and me to uh, dully explain the philosophical connection between we'll my stories. We'll try not to bore you. We won't do that. Um, but uh, usually, uh, sometimes I just talk about one story for a while with someone and, and we get to the roots of it. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I find talking about writing generally difficult. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Okay. You'll, we'll you'll talk be glad about to hear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll talk about reading. But <gasps> when you said that, that these 19 stories are around a philosophical point or question, right. I mean, is there a unifying? To me, it's not that different from um, from feel free. The same um, impulse. What, what would it? What does freedom look like or feel like? What does it consist of? How do some freedoms impinge on others? What's the tension between duties and rights? I'm always thinking about the same thing. I think it just turns up in different forms. I mean, it's interesting you should say that because I felt like there were a lot of lines of connection between Feel Free, which was your previous book, right, right. immediately before that, and this. And I guess that leads to the question, when you're writing, how do you figure out what form the writing is going to take? Because there are stories in Grand Union that, to me, feel like essays. Right. Um, and there's so many different modes. There's, you know, sort of auto fiction, there's satire, there's speculative fiction. Like, how does it, how do you decide what it's going to be? I guess I kind of, I'm thinking about doing something to the reader. In essays it's obvious, I suppose, because what you're generally trying to do is uh, force submission to an argument, one way or another. So your, your aim is quite clear. Um, but what I'm trying to do when I write is c complicate consciousness. Because it's, it's my view, not that 
fiction makes you a better person, but that some of the things that you need in order to read intelligently and variously are the same things you need to bring to an, an ethical life. It's the same complicated consciousness. If you take it all the way from maybe what a tweet does to you to what Tolstoy does to you, there's a, there's a great extension in Tolstoy. Many different emotions, many different kinds of responses. And what excited me about short stories, I think, is exactly the opposite of what's become the fashion, is exactly the variety. Like the complaint that you're being dragged from pillar to post. Well, well life drags you from pillar to post, or, or it should do, unless you're living in a completely homogenous environment. Wait, what am I saying? Yeah. Yeah. Unless you're, uh, uh, you should be... You should be dragged a little bit from here to there. And that complication of your interior is important. I thought what really struck me talking to readers about this book is how, it doesn't surprise me, but how innocent we've come in front of voices, of language. Like there's one story in it that's narrated by God, but because it's in the first person, and we're so used you to reading... You dare to take on the voice of God. <laughs> yes, I thought it'd be funny. <laughs> but a very uncertain God, a God who is, is a, a particular kind of God, a God who is a creator God and, and no more. So he isn't involved in the ethical decisions of people. It's only a creator, creator God. It's a particular vision of God. Um, but because it was in the first person, to the reader, that's just me. And in fact, many, many stories are read that way, are read through that lens. And, and it does. In, part of writing it was to try and remind myself and readers there are many, many ways to use rhetoric. There's many, many ways to speak and think and develop an idea. It's not only, I felt this. I felt this and I started typing. I mean, like, if you know what you feel before you start typing, isn't it kind of It's usually a dead? problem, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's usually a problem. So trying to... It's an exercise for me, and maybe it isn't an exercise in style, but to me, uh, you know, life is an exercise in style. It's an exercise in dealing with different components of people's lives, reading them, comprehending them, trying to make some sense of them, and it's an ongoing process. It's not set. Um, so I wanted that difference. Yeah. All right, I want to ask you both about motivation in terms of style, but then also kind of larger force. And I'll start with style because there are some writers like Patrick Modiano where, you know, it's a little bit the same book each right. time, even though it's different. And you assume that he has some goal that he's setting right. for himself that... Um, which is no crime, by the way, the shelf of books which has that central... Right. And then there are other people where every yeah. book is very different. And in this story collection, every story is really quite different is part of that sort of challenge yourself, thinking I'm gonna just, I'm gonna try to tell it in this way. I'm gonna go for satire, I'm gonna go for something, you know. Yeah, certainly, like I do think of writing as a, as a tool and one of the questions is, what can I do with this tool? How much fun can I have with it? But, but in a slightly more expansive way, thinking of my students, wanting to remind them there's more than one way to skin a cat. Like, even if you don't like all these ways that I've demonstrated, just remember them. Remember that the first person present tense isn't the only thing that exists in the world of fiction. And in fact, that point of view is incredibly restricted. Are you the seeing that a lot with your students? Almost entirely, yeah. All I ever get is, I'm here, I walked here, I was here, we're going, we're moving. We're, it's like, <laughs> just, it's, I know that it's happening right now. Yeah. I don't need a continual present tense. We see it every tense. day. <laughs> but it's interesting to me philosophically, that restriction, because it's obviously about a sense. I mean, the student who's writing like that is writing from a completely different idea of... of a human's relation to the world than Tolstoy. Tolstoy feels himself above the world, describing it, writing it, understanding it. My student thinks of themselves in the flow of information, in the flow of the present, with no authority of any kind, apart from the personal. I, I, I am here. This is happening. I mean, I think that's so fascinating that, that there's, I wonder, if, is it a kind of fear, like that people think that young people today in their writing feel like they don't have, they can't presume that level of authority or I, I just think that the history expanse? of literary styles is the history of different attitudes towards the world. And you can kind of track them from like 17th, 18th, 19th century. The high point of that kind of enlightenment, uh, full knowledge, full conception is in the 19th century novel. And, and I think we have a great affection for the 19th century novel because of its feeling of security and certainty and the idea of a person being in control of what they see, being able to comprehend it. Maybe Jane Austen is a perfect example, right, of here is a complex social problem, here is a consciousness, I'll sort it all out for you. Um, mean, but there's very few writers, I would say, who feel, feel that kind of confidence now. Do you think that that kind of first person, sort of um, in the present moment, writing reflects or leads to a kind of myopia? I think maybe it sometimes mistakes what immediacy feels like on the page or urgency. It, it, it doesn't come from the present tense. It's not immediately delivered. 
I am here walking, that bores me personally to tears, like I, I can barely read <laughs> in that tense. But it, it's a mistaken idea of, of what's possible in language, you know. Um, I mean, we see that in criticism at the book review, where the first person comes in almost reflexively, often right. necessarily, where if you're saying, if you're writing in, the, in, a, in a review of a book what you think, you don't need to say, I think, because we know it's your review of the book. Yes. Um, <laughs> I mean, I always repeat it, but I, when I was a student, I thought a lot about Aristotle and this thing about pathos, logos, and ethos, so that whenever you are working on a piece of rhetoric, as he would have called it, those three elements are in your mind with equal weight. The pathos, which is the emotional element you're discussing. Logos, which is the facts, knowledge of the world, what can be known. And ethos, which is the ethics of the thing. For me, the perfect essay combines those three elements. They're kind of plaited together. But the idea that pathos is like the winning card, and boom, I win. <laughs> is it doesn't it doesn't work for me. All right, I'm going to do something and put you a little <laughs> bit on the spot to apply that to one of your essays. I was rereading some of the essays in Feel Free, which is a really interesting, varied collection. Um, and this was part of the section I think on in the audience, and it was Generation Y. Oh yeah, yeah. So. That's an essay about uh, the social network, David Fincher's movie about Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg. But how would those three kind of elements? I had to, when I was writing that essay, uh, first of all, it was, was it 2008 or something? I know, this is so very unfair. I'm making you write, talk about something you did. I was very scared to ago. write it because there w I, I, everyone had already called me a Luddite in my personal area, my family, my students. Um, I, I couldn't find any body who felt the way I felt. It just I just could not find a single person who didn't think Facebook was the greatest thing that ever existed. The internet was just fabulous. Every part of it was fabulous. And uh, so it, it was a bit, um, it was quite alienating walking around the world, you know, because I had this feeling it was persistent, but I just couldn't find any fellow. You had to go on Facebook and find the Facebook. Yeah, I had to go, I yeah. I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't find anyone who felt the way I did. Self-hating Facebookers. So I wrote it with a lot of anxiety, and I guess when I was writing it, I thought, as I always thought, uh, I, I, just because I feel it doesn't mean it's right, basically. So I, I was reading a lot of tech stuff, which is very far outside my natural area. I'm not, I'm not good in, in tech area or sciences or math or anything. So it was a great strain for me to read these books, but I, I thought I have to... I don't want the accusation of Luddite to be true. I want my instinct to have some kind of um, basis. So that, that's how I met Jaron Lanier and started talking to him, who's a kind of uh, uh, one of the founders of virtual reality, um, but also a tech critic um, of a very interesting kind. So that, and watching the movie, talking to my students, there is this personal element there, and also kind of self-questioning. Like I, I was aware of, um, you know, not getting it being of slightly the wrong generation, being at a distance. Um, but sometimes uh, that little distance or that objectivity can be useful, you know? It, it can be the tool which allows you to see something slightly differently than it's being seen at that moment. Um, but I, I do remember polishing that essay and walking into class the next week, and my students were embarrassed for me, I think. Oh profoundly no. embarrassed <laughs> for me that I, had, uh, that I had written this ridiculous piece against something that seemed to them unquestioningly a good thing. It's so hard to put ourselves back in that mind state, but it, that's how it felt then. Um, Some of us still feel that way. Right. So maybe we're ultra Luddites. But, um, but I, 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 like I, I'm still proud of that essay. I'm not usually proud of things I write, but I'm proud of it because it, 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 gave, uh, it, it gave a reason for what I had decided to do, which was opting out of the stuff you're all opting into, by which I know I lose so much. I lose the day-to-day. -day. I don't know what's going on at Twitter every moment. I lose so much. But I thought the thing I will gain is my independence of thought. And if it can be worth that, I don't mind losing the other thing. And I should say, Jaron Lanier, um, whom Zadie just mentioned, if you're not familiar with his work, he was one of the pioneers of virtual reality technology. But he wrote in the last few years a couple of great books. You Are Not a Gadget is one. A and wonderful book. You should get it if you can. And most yeah. recently, I think, 13 Reasons for Killing, Deleting All Your Social Media Another Accounts great Now. Book. So you're ahead <laughs> of the game there. You've already yeah. done it. Jaron Lanier. Lanier. Yeah. yeah, it's a terrific book. <laughs>
Um, he's a great talker. I remember like once interviewing him and the interview was a phone interview. It went on and on and on and on. And I was like down, I was in the subway and I was like, I got to go. I'm going to like lose you any, and it just ended as I went to the tunnel. And I <laughs> yeah, he never stops. Yeah. But he's brilliant. But the, these books are short and, uh, and powerful. Um, you and I actually both just read a book on technology that is not short. No, um, it's really very long. Yes, um, yeah. Shoshana Zubkoff's The Surveillance Art. Capitalism. But you know, re really helpfully, she just wrote a three-page summary of that book in the New York Times maybe two or three days ago. Yes. And uh, if, if I have no primer. other purpose on this stage, it's go and read that article. It takes like nine minutes and it might change your life. Uh, the it's the, her name is Shoshana Zuboff, Z-U-B-O-F-F. -F, the article is something like, you are now remote controlled. That's what it's called. Um, that's definitely worth reading if you haven't got time for 700 pages on the same topic. <laughs> anyway. <Yes. laughs> so to get back to this other question of like motivating factor behind yeah. like what compels you to write. Like I was interviewing recently the author Ted Chiang. Oh, he's uh, extraordinary. Brilliant, yeah, brilliant guy. Really brilliant. He had uh, a short story collection that came out last year called Exhalation, which I highly recommend, which is speculative science fiction. And he's a very slow, deliberate writer, a computer manual sort of writer by day, and just this really inventive fiction by night. But I asked him, you know, what is it that, like, where do you start, you know, your stories? And he said he, that he starts with a philosophical question. So yes. that, you know, one, one story began with the question of what would happen, you know, in time travel stories, people often talk about, um, you know, changing the future. But right. what would that look like if you couldn't change the future, if there was eternal fate? Right. Um, and, that, uh, and then how would that story operate? So you said something interesting yesterday uh, in conversation with Michael Shaban um, that you had looked back on your novel on beauty and you realized that probably like the one true thing in there and maybe the thing that you needed to get out had to do with like fisticuffs yeah, when you were 15 years old. Well, it's something George Saunders said a little earlier today about the workings of the subconscious which, which are undeniable. Like the novel is somehow quite far back in your mind and it does exist in some whole form back there. Getting onto the page is a battle with uh, ego, vanity, insecurity, depression, you know, there's a lot of things that stop stop it getting there accurately. But it is striking when, when he I think he called it the flow, which is also a term in, in the kind of Buddhism he studies, where, where you feel that the thing is just already there. Yeah. It has some kind of deep structure and you relay it on the page. But the kind of writing Ted Chiang does, uh, I mean, that's at the extreme end. I admire it enormously, but it is like moral philosophy and it's moral philosophy concerned with technology, so it's super useful for anyone reading a, a short story writer like that, because as we rush ahead with the technology, our philosophical ideas about them are, are childlike. Mm -hmm. Like, we use it, we have, no, we have no understanding of what we're using. So Ted is, to me, that's a public service, what he does. It's a kind of uh, explication of things we do every day thoughtlessly, and he brings it to mind, and he makes it entertaining enough that you can deal with it in fictional form, but it absolutely seems to me to be philosophy in his case. But uh, m many writers don't work that way. But and does. you don't work that way, apparently. So, like, what do you, when you sit down, if it's not a, a philosophical question, that's sort of the driving thing, and maybe it... No, people, is it revenge? voices, images, you know, how people talk is of endless interest to me, you know. Trying to, to get that down on the page to convey them. Life, just life. I'm very greedy for life. I'm very aware of only having one turn. And for me, writing is, is the, uh, the chance to do it multiply, you know, over and over. You mentioned that you look back on your writing and you're like, you, there are things you aren't proud of. Um, and I have to ask, I mean, you wrote White Teeth now, it's 21 years? Yeah. You were 23 years old? Like what, when you look back and think about that moment, like what do you, what do you, like how do you see it now? Because uh, this so was, you know, for those who don't know, a massive worldwide phenomenon? Um, I, I mean, I was a kid, obviously. I, I started writing when I was 20, 21. Um, I don't know. I, I think about it uh, as a book for young people. And I'm really glad that, that that's what it is. That's how I think about it. And, and the kind of writers it was influenced by, I guess particularly people like Dickens. Dickens is also, he, there are some great late works, but ideally I think Dickens is for, for children and young people. The vision of the world is schematic, you know, in a certain way. The comedy is uh, overdone <laughs> in various well, parts. Which novels are you thinking about? <laughs> enjoyable. Well, I'm reading Great Expectations with my daughter yeah. right now, and, and 
she's just the right age for it, I would say. You know, 10. 10 is ideal for great expectations. Before, older than that, an adult will have reservations about the crazy consistency of certain characters who seem almost like clockwork in their habit of repeating certain terms over and over. But I, that, I like, White Teeth to me is for teenagers, and, and those kind of books that I loved when I was a teenager were the most important books to me. So if it ends up being that kind of book, I would be delighted. What does your daughter think of Great Expectations so far? Um, uh, what's really striking to me is, is uh, so we're in our 40s, and I remember reading that young, and either we were much more submissive readers as children, so we just, there were p passages we didn't understand, but we just kept on going, or the gap between 18, the language of the 1870s and 1989, and 89 and now, there's been a radical speeding up of, of the distance because so much of it is uh, really hard for her to understand. I find myself translating. Even as I'm translating, it's difficult. The way I would translate medieval Chaucer, I'm now translating Dickens, who when I was young, I just thought of as just then, you know, just yesterday. Right. So it's kind of wild that the gap has got bigger. Teaching it must be really hard now. I d maybe nobody is, but the language is, seems so far away. Yeah, I, I, you know, I also, I, I wonder if you have this experience too, and I, maybe it's my kids, and maybe it's your kids too. There were many things that I was read to, that I read as a child, or that I saw the movie, and the things that I didn't understand, I just kind of let it go. Right. Whereas I feel they like don't do that. they don't do that. They want to know everything, them. you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, like watching The Sound of Music. They want to know about like the, the Nazis. You've got to stop that before the Nazis. That's the key. <laughs> my kids still don't know that there are Nazis in Sound right. of Music. I'm halfway. I, cause I don't, do I have to explain Nazis right now? You're five. <laughs> I'll do it in a few years. Um, yes, the language, but even with my students, like the, any language which veers from the kind of common sense speech we're using now, has become increasingly difficult. Like teaching the bluest eye, Morrison has a very rich diction, you know, almost 19th century in its depth, and they, f they find it super hard because everything they're reading sounds like this. So uh, a transcription of speech. At the risk of us sounding like old fogies since we're both in our old 40s, yeah. like, do you, like, have people, like, what's happened? Like, why can't people access that kind of sophisticated use of language as readily? I, I, I mean, people are reading more than they ever have, but they are reading this illusion, journalistic and digital, that writing is just um, transferred speech. And any variation of that has become suspicious, right? <laughs> like, it's something suspicious about not speaking in the common sense language. So the common sense language, as we know, is so heavily manipulated um, and such a dark source of power for people in power. So there's nothing common sense about it. But, but it is hard to get people to stop um, what George might call the monkey mind going, because the monkey mind's going all day with the phone. But I think you can still, I, I feel optimistic. With my students, I say to them, it's 14 weeks. Can we make a deal? It's 14 novels. Of course, they're not going to throw their phones in a burning bin. I'm not delusional. But could you make a little effort just for these 14 weeks to move at the pace of these novels? You give them which 14 means, novels in 14 weeks. Yeah, which also means the pace of the 20th century, because that's my course try and imagine what it was to be in the 20th century, how people thought, how they expressed themselves. Uh, the first thing I say to them is, this course is not about you, which is quite a challenging thought. <laughs> or, or me. <laughs> it's about these books. So how do you choose the books? I mean, you've been teaching at NYU for a while now. Um, do the books change over time? And They usually stay the same with little adaptations, but uh, it's a, a specific tale about what happened in 20th century writing. Mm -hmm. So it, it's uh, it, it's an start? argument, you know, a historical argument. So in that way, it really doesn't have much to do with them. Though, of course, they're in the room, I'm in the room. We're trying to remember what that journey was about. So those of you who are not grad students at NYU in Zadie's class and want to, you know, get a taste, like, what do you have them read? Um, uh, we start with Ed Edwardian, Forster, because it's just on the turn, and then there's Kafka, um, there's some Baldwin... Uh, there's all kinds of people. There's uh, European writers, um, Toussaint, Annie No at the very end, which is a book about the 20th century. Um, lots of different people, but uh, I find part of the trick sometimes is to allow them to feel uh, superior to the 20th century. So I will say to them, you know, I, I understand that you are not self-conflicted or self-hating like James Baldwin, which is great for you. Mm -hmm. How great that you are happy. But James Baldwin in 1956 was not that happy. 
for various reasons, contingents and structurally. So he will express himself in ways that you, I'm sure you will diagnose as self-hating. But uh, you try being black and gay in 1956. See how that would have been for you. So trying to get a certain amount of historical humility. And then the other thing is trying to say something like, which, which I believe in is friendly, is imagining a class like ours, 45 years in the future, probably up to their neck in water with burning buildings or whatever, but 45 years into the future, thinking about my students who may be now are famous writers and reading their books and trying to figure out how they thought they had the right to write these books when they held in their hands a piece of technology which they knew had cobalt in it, which is mined by children in the Congo. They knew that, mm -hmm. they'd read about it, but they still carried these phones everywhere. They ate meat, can you imagine they ate meat? A daily holocaust of animals every day didn't bother them. Went around writing their novels. So those kind of thought experiments, I think, are helpful yeah. to imagine what you look like 20 years from now, 30 years from now. So we, we have still five minutes before questions, but I want to be able to ask some of the questions that I feel like you might want to ask, because there are certain questions that anytime someone has the opportunity to ask um, a full-time writer, they, they just want to know certain things. And one of those things, it's inevitable, like, how do you write? Like, what does your day look like as a writer? Are you a writing in short bursts kind of person? Do you immerse yourself? Are you a night owl? Like, how do you go about this? I, I think I do remember those questions being relevant before I had children, but I don't, <laughs> they're not, they don't have, don't have any bearing on my reality. I get up like everyone else in New York in some stupid gym clothes. I run to school. I try and do a workout. I run back to my desk. I think, shall I do the laundry or shall I write a paragraph? Shall I do the laundry? <laughs> do the laundry. Then it's 12 o'clock, and then you've got three hours for you to pick them up from school. So that's my schedule. If something gets done in those three hours, great. Sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> that's a, that's a, a good <laughs> answer. And you're, I mean, I want to go back to technology for a moment because this is another question that comes up a lot right now with writers when you talk to them about the time and the setting of the novel, which is... It's a big question. It's for movies, too. Is it before the internet and cell phones, or is it after? Mm. Because it fundamentally changes. I was watching The Terminator with my middle child the other night, you know, and there's just all that tension, if you remember at the beginning, where she's, like, on the payphone, <laughs> and then, you know, there's this horrible yeah. thing that happens at the answering machine, right. and your next uh, novel, you said yesterday, is, is, takes place in the 1980s in right. Russia. Did that play into it all, thinking... Um, I do think, th this is, I don't think it's a general opinion, but for me, when I think about fiction, I think, I love to have all kinds of readers, but I think specifically of my generation in time. They're, I'm writing for them. We lived together, we grew up together, we share a certain vision of the world. That, they're my generation. And you think about writing to your generation? I think about them. I think about how, what we felt, our delusions, which were so many, so various, and the process of being humbled over and over again that I think it may be particular to Generation X, but we really, we really felt it. We had a lot of absurd ideas, I would say, about pretty much everything. Yes. So the humbling is pretty extreme. And so I write for them, and so a lot of it is nostalgic, I think. Like, I don't have any urge to keep up with the kids, you know? I love the kids, I read their writing, I'm excited by it, but I do think generationally, and I think I'm writing my little stack of books for the people who live and die with me. As it should be. As yeah. a member of your generation, I think Gen X is the generation that probably feels like the most besieged. If, if you all think that, I, I don't think there are many Gen Xers, there's a few. Um, but <laughs> but we, we might have it, have it the worst. But your, this novel, is, does it, is it set in 1989? It's so ridiculous to talk about novels that are like this. I've written a page. Okay. <laughs> but, um, it's almost done. Yeah, so close. Um, but... Yeah, it's an, it's an amazing moment, right? Because it's a hopeful moment. Yeah, and I, I thought a lot about... I've always thought a lot about the wall and, and that moment, almost like Vaclav Havel and Hungary, this kind of moment of incredible uh, consciousness transformation, which is, I guess, a dream of all uh, people who work in language, right? That language could ha play a sufficient role or a serious role in the changing of reality. 1989 is a little bit like that, you know. So... Um, it's just interesting, and also gives me an opportunity to learn something, which, which I always hope for with each novel. What are you hoping to learn with this? Uh, Russian history. That's, that's what I'm into right now. Yeah, I'm curious. So 1989 is a very hopeful moment. Right. Um, I'm going to speculate that maybe 
but correct me if I'm wrong, you don't think that our current moment is especially hopeful? I'm tr I, I try, I, I really, uh, I'm optimistic by instinct. I'm, I'm really trying. And I also, <laughs> I also, th I also think um, that so, some of the, like in my line of work where people are complaining about the supposed excesses of students one way or another, I, I have to think from thinking of us at the same age, these people want change with an absolute burning desire. They want justice and they want truth. And I have to respect that because as far as I can remember, when we were that age, we wanted to go dancing, maybe <laughs> save a dolphin, maybe, if we had right. time. <laughs> but we weren't oh heavily well. involved. I'm sure there were many activists amongst us and the wonderful Naomi Klein was like a shining example. But I remember reading Naomi and thinking, oh gosh, good for you, but I am gonna go dancing. So my, my generation has nothing to cover itself in pride about as far as I can see. We pursued our desires pursued our ideas of the kind of lives we wanted. Now, of course, in a political context, I hope for a moment where people feel free enough to do what we did, but we have to get there again. And so I, I have optimism about that instinct in young people. With my students, all I'm trying to do is, is take that feeling, which I consider almost entirely positive, and make sure that they have tools for thinking. Because I think that's what activists need. I'm no activist, I don't have the gene. But I do know how to construct arguments, how to write, and how to think, and how to demonstrate what thinking looks like. Not shouting, not ad hominem attacks, but thinking. Do you think that, you, uh, not being an activist, but being a writer, that, that that impulse comes through in your writing, that urge, that, that, that... I want clarity, I want things to be clear. I want not to be a hypocrite, though everyone's a hypocrite, I want to reduce the amount of my hypocrisy, and I want to try and tell the truth. And I think most activists want something similar in the social body. But you, you, need, you need more than just shouting and numbers, you, you need to be able to convince, you know. So a lot of my work with my students, I, probably they won't become published writers or whatever, but they might become journalists, which is an incredibly important job right now. They might have some <coughs> use of language in the social body, and I, I can help that make sure that that is, has more clarity. Um, I want to take it from your students to other books. I was sitting at a luncheon the other day for a number of authors with books coming out this year, and one of them who was sitting next to me was a student of yours, a former student of yours who has a novel coming out. Um, and she said, you know, um, Zadie Smith is like a role model to me and, and was a mentor to me and, and all of that. Um, and, uh, and when I mentioned this to you the other night at dinner, you knew immediately who I was talking about. Yes, because she didn't need any help. You know, that's the kind of slightly tragic part about my job is that when people with real talent come along, I'm totally <laughs> useless. So uh, <laughs> she just wrote a great book and that was all there was to it, basically. Um, really striking book, she's a young African-American writer. She's so fantastic, called Raven Baptiste. Um, so th that is wonderful when that happens. But but I guess I don't teach for that reason. I teach for everybody else. Like, that person will be fine, no matter what, always fine. So you mentioned when you were working on White Teeth that Dickens was kind of your model in mind in a certain way. When you're writing now, are there writers writing today who you feel particularly inspired by or challenged by, even if you're not trying to do the same thing? Right. It's not that I've lost my old influences, but you add things, and, and the addition makes the mix different. Like, I will never lose from Dickens the love of, of people mm -hmm. in their comedy and in their absurdity. To me, that's the burning heart of the novel. And any writing which uh, hates people, I, I find difficult, even when it's cerebral and brilliant. I, I, want, I want to hear about people. Um, I think the thing, stuff I find most inspiring are, are the, y the young ones, you know. I, you. I really like everybody else. I think Sally Rooney is terrific. I, I've never really seen since Muriel Spark such a clean sentence with so much depth behind it. Muriel Very Spark unusual. Muriel is having a little renaissance too. Which Muriel Spark's a genius. Going and back to and that, is a, that part really interests me that when I grew up, when you grew up, uh, maybe not in America, but certainly in England, writers like Muriel Spark, uh, even, can you believe it, Toni Morrison in England, um, were minor by definition. Hmm. You know, we were given this very uh, dominant masculine canon and you were meant to fit in the women around the sides, you know? 
Penelope Fitzgerald, Muriel Spark, Tony, Alice Walker, whoever I read, it was all minor as far as my uh, academic life was concerned when I was doing my degree, with the exception eternally of Austin and Eliot. So it's very exciting for me now to see what was considered marginal at the center, you know. That I find very thrilling. All right, well, you are certainly at the center. I don't want to monopolize. I want to open this up to questions from all of you. Um, so just raise your hand, and I'll repeat the question. Hey. Oh, come on. I know I you know, have I've questions. I could keep going. Silence, In the back. Yeah. Yes. Oh. Oh. Uh, Orwell is my hero. I actually owe a piece to the Times on Orwell, which is, is unwritten. Thank you. So thanks for bringing yes. that up. Yes, no, um, I'm just going to file it. Uh, <laughs> um, Orwell's really interesting to me because I guess I grew up on him with a fundamental misunderstanding. I didn't understand that he was posh. I guess the books that I were given by my father, who loved Orwell, and my father was working class, he, we, we missed some aspect. Of course, when I grew up, I understood that it's even, in some ways, a more extraordinary achievement because he relinquished his class position in order to write these books and to think with us or in our space. Um, and again, the incredible clarity. I, I find Orwell a bit overwhelming because it's all good. You know, there's so much. What, what there's been some bad to me, novels, aren't there? There's some bad novels, but there's so many letters which are extraordinary, so many essays. Um, and even the bad novels, I, I mean, coming up for air, I love that novel. I, I find everything about him... Uh, Oh, he's much fiercer than I could ever imagine being. But, but the commitment to clarity is amazing. So when, when you teach him, to me it's about uh, showing what can be done with a certain kind of Anglo-Saxon, uh, uh, unfancy British sentence, you know, without the French decoration or whatever. He, he's very determined on a very plain vocabulary, and it's so powerful. And I just think that's a useful lesson to students who, who are tempted to... Um, decorate, you know, and think that you need to do a lot to have a big effect. He, he proved the opposite. And he creates outrage in the reader without, uh, you know, pointing and saying, oh, look at this outrage. It's all implicit and it's, it's very strong. Yeah. If only every writer, aspiring writer, read politics in the English language, we would yeah, all be saved a lot. It would be better, yeah. <laughs> bad reading experiences. Other questions? Yes. Um, yes. Oh, sorry. Oh, who do I have? Um, um, Hilary Mantel is there, but an early novel um, called Experiment in Love. There's a, the only 21st century novel is by a Rwandan writer called Scholastic Mukasonga. It's called it Barefoot Cap Woman, which is a really extraordinary uh, book. Because I always end the course with one contemporary novel. Um, who else is on there? There's a few. Now I'm forgetting all the writers of my course. The city is very anti-women. Yeah, yeah, can't um, stand them. <laughs> um, Tony K. Bambara, African-American writer of the 80s. Um, who else? Tony, uh, say, say again. Morrison? Uh, Morrison, Bluest Eye, yeah. Um, so it's about half women, half men, and kind of a lot Anglo-American, but some French as well, and you know German language of Kafka. Um, but I also want to kind of trace the arc of the 20th century, so the women tend to pile up in the second half of the course, you know, which is how it was. I'm not trying to uh, teach a kind of ideological version of it. I'm trying to teach an abbreviated description of how it actually was. And certainly for me, writing, trying to start writing at 15, 16, I would sit in, in my room, like, so troubled, trying to think of a single woman writer who wasn't a suicide, or I could not, th I would sit around. A.S. Byatt was always the one I came up with. A.S. Byatt. It's like, that's not a good enough answer. I needed more answers, you know. And of course, there were many answers, but not in my school and not in my university. So it was a kind of ed education I made as an adult. But uh, my kind of community of sisters was very small, and none of them were my sisters. Like Virginia Woolf, I love, but that's not my people. All the African-American writers from America, I love, but again, to try and think of a black British female writer when I was starting, I, you know, I couldn't imagine. It was hard to imagine that space. Is that space opening up now? Yes, it's completely different. It's a completely different world. And it was already, like, my mother's best friend, Margaret Busby, had published this book, Daughters of Africa, um, in the early 90s, which had two, over 200 writers from the African diaspora. So Margaret was already thinking that way, mm -hmm. diasporically, across borders. But I was, you know... 
12 or whatever. I wasn't paying <laughs> close attention. But she did it again uh, two years ago, and I'm in the second volume. And it was work like, but Margaret was the only black British publisher in England, one. Um, so she did extraordinary work, but she did it entirely in an isolated fashion. So it's kind of glorious now to see the book doing so well in England and America, all these writers, and it's not hard to find these writers, you know? It was hard for her to keep it to 200, there were so many writers. So that's a different landscape, it's thrilling. In the back there was another question. Oh, yeah. And to ask you what kind of feedback have you gotten given um, the controversy around American journalism and some of these other things? Um, well, I'm sure you could probably Should I repeat the question? Oh, yeah, the, f the feedback to NSA, um, defense of fiction and American dirt, etc. cetera. Um, well, I, the feedback, it, it would outrage young people, but of course, I don't get to see it. I'm sure everybody is very angry online, but for the most part, I don't see it. You know, people, if people are really angry, they email me, and that will give me a vague idea of where we are. <laughs> So I, I get some positive emails, some negative. Uh, to me, it's a, a very uh, narrow remit, that piece. I wanted to defend a, a particular uh, psychological condition, fiction writing. I don't say it's a moral one or a celebrated one, but I, it exists. <laughs> Many people have it, and I am one of them. So I wanted to defend the state of voyeurism, which I absolutely admit to and accept as a personality trait in myself. Um, and that's what the piece is about. You know, um, but as for American Dirt, I haven't read it, so I can't uh, get into arguments about books I haven't read. As common as that is these days, I am one of these people who feels you should read the book first. Um, it's very old-fashioned. Yeah, yes. but um, a ba you know, a badly written book to me, ethical and aesthetic failures are one and the same. I don't make a distinction. Uh, uh, the ethical failure, you know, Roth is a lovely example. I, I was, I like Philip Roth. I'm a fan of Roth. No one could say he didn't have a blind spot when it comes to women, he did. So, yes, you just sit in that fact. You read the book knowing that there's something Philip missed, he fundamentally missed. Luckily, he saw a whole load of other things, so many, and managed to make his fiction out of what he could see. There is no such thing as anyone with perfect and total sight. There were things he couldn't see. Luckily, Philip is not the only person in the world. So many other people wrote books, many women wrote books, but it is a flaw in his work. But the floor is aesthetic and ethical combined. I can't separate the two. It's an absence. Question over there. Yeah. I think it helps them. Because otherwise they're just very angry at all the books. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's that kind. Of, it's talking about how how to help young people read books of the 20th century. Um, uh, do you understand what I meant earlier about historical humility? Trying to imagine that you too will be inconceivable very soon. Your ideas, your beliefs about the world, will be inconceivable. You know, I, I'm not asking you to. The question of it's a very American idea that studying literature is the exercise of approving or disapproving of books or of people in them. That's not what I'm teaching them. I'm teaching them, how does this novel work? How does it work? How does it function? How does the rhetoric function? How are characters made? Whether you like or don't like, that's a genteel moralistic decision about whether you like or don't like a character in the book. Well, you're very free to have the feeling. I just, it's not interesting to me. It's, I'm not interested in it. But of course you can have the feeling, and of course you have every right not to read the books. But for me, um, if you're interested in how I wrote my books, it's exactly by thinking of the books going back... I had to read books going back to the 1300s. I start in the medieval period all the way. That was my English course. Those books, to me, were raw material I could use. I took from here, I took from there. I don't need to swallow any novel whole. I don't need to believe in it whole. I don't need to love it, even. I need to use it. It is useful to me. And I am training writers. I'm trying to give them things that are useful to them. We have time for, yeah. So you started with a novel and then you moved into um, writing a lot of essays. And so it seems like there's a progression there, maybe not. But is there something specific that you, you think you can do with an essay that is harder to do with a novel? I think the great temptation with nonfiction is, is the opportunity to be right, which people love. 
They love feeling right. They love winning an argument. Essay will give you that possibility, even though you're not present at the moment of reading. So, of course, the reader is free at every moment to say, no, you're wrong, no, I disagree. But in fiction, there is absolutely no such comfort. You can't be right. A novel is not right, and it's not wrong. So it's not a good place to be as a writer if that's what you need from writing. If you want to be right, you probably shouldn't be a novelist. That's not, that's not the right area for you. Essays, probably, exactly. Blogging, mass tweeting. That can all be <laughs> a place in which you can be right. But a novel is not a place... That's not where rightness happens. You'll be very dissatisfied if you hope for a reader to submit and say, oh, yes, your novel was right. What, what kind of response is, to a novel is that? I am so disappointed that we're out of time because I think probably you could all ask Zadie more, many more questions and listen to her. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.